What's going on, everybody? Welcome to Charge the Line Podcast with your host, Roger Narvaez, and my good friend, Tony Perez. Today, we have a guest on that, uh, you know, oftentimes we talk about nutrition, we talk about performance, we talk about uh, diet, and we've got somebody that uh, is actually certified, certificial, I should say. He's He's got a degree um, in... Uh, well, let me just introduce him, and then we'll let you spit the details of it. Uh, but Absolutely. today we have Josh Verdusco yep. um, on our show, and uh, he's a local dietitian and nutritionist here in Corpus Christi who is uh, pretty popular. So popular, you just won the 2023 Bend Magazine yep. uh, Dietitian yep. of the Year. So congratulations mm-hmm. on you. that. Appreciate it. And then before we go any further, I got to say, we were talking off camera, but I got to say congratulations. You're, you're, you're going to be joining the... Uh, uh girl dad club here i sure am just found out yesterday so oh, thank you man. very much yeah <laughs> that's awesome that's awesome that's super <laughs> exciting man i know like we were saying there's there's no bigger struggle than being a parent but there's also no bigger um bigger gratification or mm-hmm. satisfaction that you get from from that experience so so i'm excited i'm for about you. to find out yeah, yeah it's so. gonna be fun it's gonna be fun <laughs> but let's uh, let's start with telling the audience a little bit about yourself where you grew up you know uh, what your your actual degree is in and sure. then uh, kind of go from there yeah absolutely just to make it short and sweet basically born and raised in corpus christi I uh, went to Moody High School, um, but prior to that, I was actually homeschooled for seven years. Oh, wow. Uh, I have oh, three, shit. three other brothers, uh, and my mother, she homeschooled all four of us. Wow. Uh, so from second grade to ninth grade, I was at home. Bro, okay, I gotta, a- I gotta stop. I gotta stop you right here because you think about this, okay? For you guys that don't know the Corpus area, Moody High School. That's on the west side. You got Motown. You got that's that's like it, it's not a easy upbringing over there, right? Yeah. So, what I gotta ask is, how was the culture shock going from homeschool to getting thrown into public Moody school. High School public school system? You know, no, that's a great question. And uh, the crazy thing too is that my parents are were very religious as well, so okay, we were in awesome. church four five times a week all the time so yeah. more to your point though culture shock yes so yes. when i went in as a freshman mind you i didn't i didn't get to experience the middle school uh right, you know yeah. life and so i didn't have those friends coming up with me into high school uh it it was a shock because i just didn't know anything about anything in the world yeah. other than what our mother taught us and what i knew from church and just hanging around with the kids uh, in the neighborhood, I live right. on uh, Cambridge or Cambridge. Some people yeah. call that yeah. different things right yeah. next to Fannin Elementary. And uh, yeah, uh, the only thing that, that did save me, though, save me was that I joined the football team uh, at oh, Moody in nice. 2009. Very so nice. um, that I felt a little bit comfortable because I went in with two weeks prior. You know, they do the training camp and all right, that. So right. I felt like, OK, I had a few you friends. Had a group of, of yeah. people. Exactly. So that's really what helped me kind of uh, transition from middle school, no, uh, homeschool yeah. into high school. And um, really from there, I stayed quiet the whole high school, nine, uh, four years in high school. Didn't really have much friends. Didn't go any. I didn't go to a single high school party until like my last year, senior year. Wow, and, I, yeah. and I remember this too. I went. I had one beer and then I left. Oh, shit. You're like, this your, ain't for your me. Your brothers like... are older or younger? I have one older brother. His name's Abel. Okay. And then I have two younger brothers, Jonathan and Aaron. All biblical names. My yeah, mother, yeah. again, heavy in her faith and uh, instilled a lot of good uh, beliefs and uh, basically practices in our lives. And it, it carried all the way to, to now. So always thankful. Shout out to my mother uh, yeah. for, for doing that. And of course, my dad worked his ass off to make sure that... <laughs> We were, you know, we had what we needed. Right. Um, right. He actually was a cook. This was back in probably ni- late 80s, early 90s. He was a cook for Nolan's. It's where the old steakhouse is. Yeah. But it, yeah. He used to be a cook there making five twenty five an hour Damn, and for yeah. feeding all four of us and, yeah, and my, taking care of my mother. So shout out to them. And I think a lot of what makes a lot of individuals great is their parents. Yes. You know, so. Laying uh, that foundation. I think that's one of the things, too, my um me and my fiance realized early on is like, oh, we had great parents. And so it was a reflection of how we were treating each other, you know, just meeting each other as well. I only knew my fiance, Sierra, for seven months. And I said, oh, okay, wow. you're the one. Yeah. And uh, yeah. I'm 34, she's 28. You know, there's a little bit of an age gap, but still, I think um, what we're realizing is that our parents were really the ones that helped us, you know. Yeah. Did she, did she kind of have the same upbringing as far as, um, you know, um, 
religion uh, yeah, being in for the most part. Household. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And she also had five uh, siblings, uh, four other sisters. Oh, so wow. yeah. it was kind oh, of some, yeah. some similarities there. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, well, was she, she wasn't homeschooled. Was she homeschooled? That was going to be my question. Was she <laughs> no, if she was, it would be like, <laughs> yeah, mind blown. Mind blown right? <laughs> but um, where did she go to school? She went to uh, Moody, actually, uh, oh, okay. as well. But she graduated, obviously, in her respective year. Um, but yeah, that was interesting to know. She did a little bit of college. Uh, but other than that, she was uh, a she's been with Coast Life Credit Union for about six seven years now. Nice, um, just working her way up. Formerly there. used to be a teachers credit union. Yes, and yes. Uh, she was the branch manager there in Portland for six years. Oh wow! Uh, the branch supervisor, so she was managing all the employees there and taking care of business. And then until recently, decided to step down because of the direction that we're going in right, so right right um so yeah it's been great um but just to kind of review and recap that uh graduated moody high school i was working i had my first real job at cash america pawn shop on port and airs oh we <laughs> got another pawn yeah, man was a, i was i was, was actually uh i was at first cash pawn really and i worked at port and airs but across the across, street you yeah. were across yeah. what year was, well this was oh shit man i was probably 20 it was probably from the age of 21 to 24 and i worked at first cash and then i ended up working at easy pawn too okay and I, I love i love the pawn business yeah i mean where, where we were it was kind of like if you hustle you can make money yes like there were guys that just went into work but if you were one of the top sellers i mean at that time i was probably making like 15 dollars an hour which was a, a lot, lot of yeah, money yes, i that. mean it, that yeah back then so you know, we're talking 2006, 2007. So, you know, uh, we probably weren't working in there around the same I time. I came in right in 2009. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Just across was, the pond from Roger. Yep, exactly. Yeah. Small world, man. Small world. Well, yeah. so you, you did that. And then uh, were you going to college during that so, time? Um, it was, so I started at 19 at the Cash America Pond. And I was working there for two years, so from 2009 to 2011. And I was looking, you know, at my coworkers, and I saw some of them had been there for up to 30 years. Yeah. And I yeah. started to think in my head, you know, is this something that I want to, do I see myself? Right. You know, no disrespect to them. I mean, there was a lot of hustlers and people who knew what they were doing, and they enjoyed it. Yeah. But for me, I was like, no, I, I think I, I want more. Right. And at the time, I was dating this girl, and she was attending a uh, college, uh, AMCC. And prior to her, I had no intentions of going to college at all, whatsoever. Okay. Um, Once my, you were done with school, you were you were like, I got yeah. my diploma. Let's make some money. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And and my parents, um, although they instilled a lot of great beliefs in us and so forth, they never pushed us to pursue anything in particular. Okay. They never said, "Oh, you need to go to college or you need to get this job." Right. They're just like, "Whatever you do, we'll support you." Wow. And so I think um, that was a good thing because it allowed us allowed us to get curious about what we wanted to do and the future we wanted to develop. And then it wasn't up until obviously you had some motivations and incentives. Um, my girlfriend was going there at, at the time to the right. university. I was like, well, I want to go too. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and so my mother and, and my younger brother uh, both encouraged me to go to Del Mar. And they yeah. said, you know, it's a lot cheaper. The yes. curriculum solid. And of course, I was stubborn back then. I was like, no, I want to go to university and I want to be with my girl. Yeah. And um, that's when my, my girlfriend at the time said, hey, look, uh, you're a smart dude. You should consider going to college. And I was like, really? And I was like, uh, okay, well, I'll apply and then we'll go from there. And the first semester that I had, I made, a, I remember it was, I took five classes. I didn't know what I was doing. And I made a four b's and one a oh wow. and i was like oh okay yeah, so i guess load. yeah i guess yeah. there's something to this and i think i got it and you know from then on i i started at AMCC and i was going for kinesiology like every meathead right and, uh, right trying to figure that out and um i knew i was interested in the human body that's yeah. what really got me uh started with all this this journey did, did you think about like a job like what, could I, what kind of job can i get with kinesiology yes or did was it just like oh, i'm gonna just pick no that i looked at everything yeah. so i said okay you can become a pe teacher you yeah. can become you know uh move on in the ranks to be a professor and teach physiology like i was looking at every little thing and i would already try to see myself you know a couple of years from now as what career that would be 
because I also knew it was an investment. I was about to throw thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars into this, and I wanted to know, okay, am I going to enjoy it, and is it going to pay off in the end? Right. And so um, I quickly realized kinesiology wasn't for me. Right. And so then I went in and applied to pre physical therapy and uh, quickly kind of envisioned that as well. Do I want to move arms all day and legs? And I was like, in that setting, I was like, no, I don't want to do that either. So I was at a crossroads. This was 2013. And I was 23 years old. And I was like, either I'm going to continue college or just go back again to the workforce. Right. And um, I kept kind of looking in different programs and whatnot. Okay, I I don't I hate math, you know, but science and the human body, I I still enjoy and I want to learn more of. Well, I ask you, where where mm -hmm. did did that interest kind of get sparked? Was it from your experience in athletics? Was it just you working out like what? Because, I mean, to just say, you know, I'm interested in the human body, there had to be some kind of uh, precursor to kind of get that. Yeah, I would. Yeah, I would say and I recently had to reflect on this too when i was talking to another buddy of mine was it was 2011 i was 21 again freshly out of high school uh just working my pawn shop job yeah and uh i would go to work out with my younger brother and his buddy uh roman Gantu. he was a personal trainer here he moved to san antonio i'm not too sure if y'all heard of him before big tall dude muscular dude and uh, we all used to just geek out on lifting weights. Yeah. They're at the um, Freedom Fitness where um, Corner Bakery is now. Yes. They're okay. off of Staples. Yeah, 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 yeah the OG. Right yeah. It used to be Gym X. Or before to, that? Yeah, 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 before that. So, yeah, so we used to go there and we work out and then we just became very, very interested. And I don't know if y'all know a person named Scott Herman. Uh, no, Scott, it, Big Scott, yeah. Scott Herman. He's, he's, a, he's a YouTube guy, but this is back in 2011. And he used to perform like exercise, uh, you know, tutorials and so forth. But basically somebody inspired us. Right. 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 And uh, ever since then, it was just like, well, okay, well, how do you grow muscle? How do you, you know, feed fuel your body? And that's where it started. But then when I went to college, I took uh, anatomy and physiology one and two. And so, again, me being a new student to college life and university and just studying I just, that, that course itself, anatomy and physiology was just like mind blowing to me. Uh, And so it was really the digestive system that, that got me. So I'm getting to where the antithesis of my journey began. And, uh, they were talking about once you ingest food, how you digest it, absorb it. And it just like, damn, like really we eat tons of food every year. And where do, what do we do with it? How do we process all that? And so it was really, then I said, okay, does Texas A&M University Corpus Christi have a nutrition program? And so, and I started looking it up and asking around and, and unfortunately they said, no, we don't. Oh wow. Oh, and so again, this was uh, 2013, I was 23 years old and uh, I hated traveling back then. I did not even like to go to like Dallas, Texas. Right. I hated it. Yeah. And uh, of course I was looking up other programs across, uh, around the, the local uh, areas and came across Texas A&M University, Keensville, and they offered a nutrition program. Mm. And it was at that point that I said, okay, well, it's either you go back to the workforce or you continue college. And I decided whether or not I enjoyed traveling that I was going to do that. And uh, I applied and I got accepted and I started uh, fall 2013 uh, to pursue a degree in human nutrition. And so that was my first degree, which I finished in 2016. Um, after that, I just had a bachelor's degree in human nutrition. Okay. So the reason I'm telling you this is because that we all understand the credentialing and right, all of that. Absolutely. And so basically I was just a nutritionist. Okay. Okay. And so I had the option and again, I had that itch as well to get into the workforce in 2016. Right. So, um, but it wasn't until two people that, I, that inspired me or motivated me to continue in order to get that credential as a dietitian. It was my mother and my professor. I was 26 years old, you know, I just graduated, so I was feeling myself, and I was like, all right, I'm ready to get to work, I'm ready to make some money. Yeah. And, uh, but they offered some insight, some encouragement, that they said, look, it's one more year of your life, you're going to get a credential that no one can ever take, unless you don't take your continuing education credits. Right, right. Um, but you should go for it. And so I, I thought about it, I reflected, and I said, okay, let's, let's do one more year. And uh, I'm glad I did that yeah, because yeah. it ended up being 
you know, the best decision that I made in my life because now it's just offering me opportunities that I never would have had if I remained, you know, just with that degree. Not saying that I could have done things, but um, I think really it's just the route that I wanted to take but I didn't know until other people said, hey, no, look, you should right. probably consider They're this. They're kind of pushing you a little bit. And so that was a year. Um, it was I, I was able to, unfortunately, to obtain my master's degree in human nutrition. Uh, and I did a nine-month internship unpaid uh, as part of the dietitian credentialing. So no one cannot get a dietitian uh, license or credential unless they do an internship. And it has to be accredited by the university. Oh, wow. And so, um, yeah, so basically they would ro rotate us across various, um, um, I guess, areas within the nutrition program. So it was clinical, it was community, and it was food service. So I would rotate at hospitals. I would rotate in community-based er areas that revolved around food. And then I would rotate uh in food service areas as well oh wow so, yeah so you got you got a little bit of everything yes there. yeah exactly so what what exactly is the difference it, i mean explain a little bit uh further as far as nutritionist and dietitian is it just the the extra year of schooling basically or what i guess <clears throat> what it's kind of like a nurse nurse and then a nurse practitioner and then like a, a, a primary uh physician right mm -hmm. like nurse prac can write scripts mm -hmm. but uh there's a difference there between what a, a doctor can do with um more so between nurse and nurse practitioner di that, diagnosing and not diagnosing there you go that's mm -hmm. what i was getting at yeah so like with you dietitian slash nutritionist i sure. mean is it like i can write nutritional programs and have you know um and i guess get paid for that or mm -hmm. i mean what, what what's the difference there yeah so the main difference is and i love this question is uh we all have an uncle right yeah so your uncle could be a nutritionist. Okay. So uh, anyone can call themselves any, a nutritionist. Yes. Really? Yes. Okay. Um, that title is not protected by the state of Texas. Oh, wow. Okay. So that's the difference. Uh, whereas but, to get it, but, to, but to be a di dietitian, you have to go through the schooling to be process. a nutritionist. Mm -hmm. And it's protected. Yeah. Wow. So, so yeah. So I'm a, I've just added a new uh, you sure? I just added I <laughs> well, was gonna say I just added a that, new credential. What that reminds me about well, what 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 resonates with me is like everything on social media now, right? You get advice from everything. So yes. you know, saying someone's a nutritionist makes it sound like they know what they're talking about. Sure. And so I mean we have to be careful of what we see and what we now I wonder how many people out there are actually just posers <laughs> right <laughs> i'm sure there's quite a few hey it's 2024 sure so quite a few. Yeah. Yeah. everybody's got an uncle man everybody's got an <laughs> uncle yep that makes sense well that's that's good that's good to know man because that's mm -hmm. some information that i'm sure people yeah. see the titles and everything and they're mm -hmm. like oh this person has to know what they're talking gotta about know what he's talking and about. in reality it's like no they're probably just regurgitating some shit they saw off of youtube or sure. facebook or and, and i'll say this too roger is that um not all dietitians are good either Right. Like so else, just right? like anything else. Right. Policemen, firemen, you know, yeah. we have good ones and we have not so great ones. So um, at the same time, you know, I'm not trying to crap on uh, nutritionists, as, nutritionists as well, because there are good nutritionists. Yeah. Right. So I think in the end of the day is uh, what are their values? What are their ethics? And uh, at the same time, you know, I know everyone's trying to make a living for themselves. But how are you going about doing that? Yeah, so. Right. Yeah. Well, the thing about that too is, is just like what we talk about, right? It's it's there's always things that are changing, um, especially with nutrition, especially with diet, which we're gonna get into more depth on. But you know, um, if you're not staying in the know about mm -hmm. those changes, then you're not really gonna progress. Mm -hmm. And so, if you're working as a nutritionist slash dietitian with information that you gained 20 years ago, and you're not <laughs> trying to further your education then yeah you're probably not going to be the the guy that you can that find you, that in any career right like and, and the that's, fire, yeah. pumping, fire department yeah like you're still using old tactics and we're you know at a different time with yeah. different building materials with different things change you know and and, and like you said we, we have a we have a, a saying in the fire department is it, one thing firemen hate it's change right mm. it's like we are just creatures of habit and so that's where we'll segue into the nutrition aspect mm -hmm. of of dieting because you know you had mentioned it earlier but i mean as human beings we i mean we have a routine mm -hmm. we have our um our um vices that yep. sometimes we can't just lifestyle. let go of yeah. lifestyle but you know in all of that 
all these fads come out, all these diets come out. You've got keto, you've got carnivore, you had Atkins back in the day, you mm -hmm. shit, you had the Jenny Craig. My mom was, <laughs> and looking at it now, I'm like, you, she, she went to a place that was giving her boxed foods that are like, I mean, processed, foods. processed, preserved, and they were, they made millions upon mm -hmm. probably billions of money off of that marketing scheme, yeah. you know, and go, you know, no wonder she never, or she would yo-yo, she would always yo-yo, she would, she would go in and that scale would be up when we, and now that I think about it, it's like, they're probably just starving her like on carbs one week and then, you know, yeah. it's like, it, it's, it's ridiculous, but you know, how do you, I mean, approach people that come to you with those questions? Hey, what about this diet? What about that mm -hmm. diet? You know, what, what is your response to them? Yeah. So I had to learn how to respond to that question over the years. Right. <laughs> yeah. uh, in the beginning, as a young dietitian or even a young uh, enthusiast for fitness and nutrition, um, I used to be very, very passionate with what I believed or what my approach was. And I would immediately try to respond and shove it down their throat. Right. When in actuality, we both were doing the same thing. Yes. And so now my approach is or my response is, is are they really trying to learn or are they trying to confirm their bias to, to me? Yeah. And so when I really kind of inflect that uh, within a couple of seconds, I just let them talk. Yeah. And I don't say anything and I just nod my head. Yeah. Because number one, I'm not getting paid for it. Right. <laughs> number right. two, if you just want to confirm confirm your belief, then um I'm gonna allow you to do that. You're a free person. Man, you're a better man than me. I'm so <laughs> damn argumentative. I will I'll like fight and do the nail and I'm trying to get better at that as I get older. But yeah. that that's gotta be annoying to hear somebody coming to you like you said and i never looked at it like that because mm -hmm. i can apply that to so many different aspects of life yeah somebody coming to you to confirm their bias yes. right they're not trying to actually learn they're trying yeah. to get you to make what they're doing okay yeah right yeah. So, <laughs> that's awesome man I, that's I, uh human nature i'm sure yes oh, exactly that's what we are here <clears throat> i like to call i said everyone comes with their bs and it's not what you think it is. It's called a belief system. Right. And so right. when I quickly identify that someone has a very strong belief system, that's almost never going to be broken unless they choose to change their belief yeah. system. And so I learned that over the years. And now I said, you know what? I'm going to let people keep their belief systems until they're actually ready to swap it or replace it or, you know, ready to learn something new that's actually going to benefit them. Because you know me, like if somebody comes to me and they really genuinely want help, I'm going to give them everything. Right. So, but until they're not ready for that, I, I can't really help them. Yeah. And, and that's got to be hard because I'm sure there's people out there that, that really want help. But at the same time, they they know they need to change. They know they, they kind of want to change, but they're not ready to kind of just go all in. Mm -hmm. And when you're working with somebody and giving them their diets and saying, okay, if you're going to lose weight, then we need to follow these. I mean, how frustrating is that when somebody tells you, I did everything you gave me and it's not working. And you're like, uh, I'm pretty sure you didn't do everything I gave you. Right. Yes. Like, I mean, what do you, uh, you know, how, how do you come at those folks? Yeah. First of all, I don't plan it, place any demands on them. So I never okay. say need have to should none of that. I would always, I use a different language. I use prefer. Okay. I prefer we do X, Y, Z rather than you need to, you have to, you must to. Um, and I learned this may primarily through my current practice. So I'm not sure if you're aware of, I actually work in the dialysis center. Oh, I work no, with DaVita. No. Okay. Uh, yes. Yeah. So yeah. Um, I, every day I work with patients who uh, have kidney failure. Right. And so constantly I'm educating them, counseling them. Um, we're managing disease in that setting because mm -hmm. unless they get a kidney transplant, they're there for life. Right. And they go three times a day and they have to manage their diet, manage their medication, manage their life around centered around dialysis. So um, that's where I, a lot of my patients, a lot of my approach has kind of shifted over the last yeah. couple of years. They spent a lifetime doing having a, having their belief system and eating the way that they eat that got them in that situation that they're in. Right. Mm -hmm. For the most part. Various like reasons. Yeah. Congenital or whatever. Mm -hmm. But it's going to be very difficult for you in a one hour a you know week or whatever mm -hmm. time that you sit with them to change we say this all the time how long did it take you to get to where you're at 
like nothing a, a two month diet three is not gonna just well he he you actually told me something oh, it's almost exactly like that we're different but we've got cadets and you mm -hmm. know some of them are not in the best shape although they pass the standard to get in we they know you know because I've, I've come in there and implemented a pretty uh regimented and strict um uh, workout program mm -hmm. and uh, it's pushed and broken some of them you know mentally uh and so you know but what he said and he told me and i actually told him i didn't tell you this but i said i worked out with chief betters the other day and he told me he said if you guys think you know you got these bodies that you're in some of your early 20s early 30s mid 30s so it took you 20 or 30 years to get these bodies if you think that me and talking about me that i'm going to be able to change those bodies with three workouts 45 minutes a, 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 a you know three three times a week 45 minutes and then you go home and you eat what you want and you don't exercise like then you're living in a fantasy land because that's not going to happen you know and and to what you're saying these people have lived their whole lives yes. a certain way thinking that like oh well i'm eating you know honey bunches of oats that's it's healthy it's got grains and nuts and not realizing like yeah, if you're diabetic, you probably should stay away from those type of cereals, yeah. right? Like, so, you know, um, that's got to be a struggle in itself right there, man. <laughs> yeah. That's got to be well, frustrating. Well, for me, it's, I guess God put me in this position, uh, this place in my life because he knew that I could be patient and be um, encouraging and, and really uh, provide a, more of a positive and constructive approach to patients and clients alike because yeah if i was a very uh roger like person you know maybe it would be a different story yeah. i'd just be yeah. whacking everybody over the head <laughs> not saying you do but no yeah. that's why i don't you work at devito no, that's, what, that's <laughs> what he does <laughs> <laughs> not physically yeah. yeah um but yeah so I, I i can't tell you why i have this ability to be patient with people or you know is it compassion i i don't know i i really i could label it any yeah. which way right but at the end of the day i'm just really looking out for man how am i going to get this person i wouldn't even say get because then again that's a demand right yeah. there right i would just say how can i help them find a sustainable approach like we talked about earlier to where they can implement things that they're actually looking forward to and that they could sustain across their lifetime because if they find any type of um reason to say oh this is why it doesn't work or this is why uh, it doesn't work what well because of my kids or this or that you hear it all the time people love to place agency on other things absolutely, and other people yeah. absolutely and if we provide them with approach where they can't play, place agency anymore and they have to take personal responsibility then they either could tell us straight up you know what it's just i, I don't want it at this time okay peace yeah and i move on because we can't save everyone yes i think that's the other thing i learned too is um i mean there's close to 8 billion people on this earth it's like i'm not going to be able to reach everyone so in a sense and i hate to say this i do kind of have to be uh discriminatory on who's ready and willing to receive that information and that help and that just kind of helps me a lot i think we all have to be like that man in any aspect i mean i'm the same way in the fire department i want every every cadet in this new role that i have my goal is to make sure they all um accomplish their objectives and tasks and we turn out people that are going to help the community but the but fact of the matter is as much as i love our department um it's it's human nature and like in every job we said it there's good there's good and there's bad right mm -hmm. so there's those people that fall through the cracks and there's those people that really just don't want help and they're still passing they're they're hitting the minimum standards and they're going to get by unfortunately mm -hmm. but i'm not going to waste my time on putting into them when I have so many other people that really want it, mm -hmm. that that this is literally their passion, this is their dream. They they fought and 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 those are the kind of people in any aspect of life. I think that we have to be discriminatory and and really focus on mm -hmm. and not worry about the others. Yeah. So you know you can't feel bad about that. I mean I think I think you're doing a great thing and and helping the people that want it because mm -hmm. that's where you're gonna get the most gratification. Yeah. You know when you're when you're going with people and they're constantly fighting you fighting you i mean god Lee, that's stressful <laughs> you is. know that's stressful and then now with a kid you're gonna be having enough stress <laughs> as it is bro you don't need all that so so you, I, I think, I think mm -hmm. you keyed in on something that's like really um 
is is really important and it's like that you recognize is that people don't like their will impressed upon right no so i mean that's no nobody does mm -hmm. that's why people hate some people hate police officers and you know people that do enforcement that's why people they, don't like me because you're impressing on their will right yeah. so when you when you speak the way you speak and you're able to reach them by not like mandating mm -hmm. things I think that probably opens up their yes. perspective to where it's like, okay, you know, he's trying to help me. Yeah. yeah. He's not trying to tell me, he's trying to help me. Yeah. And so I think that's probably huge. Do you, know? you find that people kind of go to you and kind of anticipate that you're going to be more, more instructing, more demanding or more like, Hey, you have to do this. You have to, I mean, is that kind of the vibe you get when it's the convention? Um, I go to this nutritionist, um, and I say that because that's what they think I am, right? Right. Uh, to get to be given a diet, that is convention, and so I'm constantly trying to reshape that yeah. uh, um, framework that they have, or try to understand it. Is why do you want to, in my head? Why do they want to be told what to eat uh, every day for the rest of their lives? And they don't. That they think that's what they want. Yeah. And so I have to find ways to really discover that. And I think uh, a big part of my process when working with the one-on-one -on -one with the client is for me to talk less and for them for me to listen more and what happens through that amazing process is that they start hearing themselves and they start formulating potential solutions and ideas then I just simply come in and like guide them and it's been the best thing in my life in terms of counseling yeah. and yeah. education in yeah. regards to food and eating in someone's body is just to simply listen to them. I almost turn like into a therapist, which I'm pretty I was going to sure say, it sounds like what you're doing is therapy. Is yeah. Like, yeah, it really does. It, I, I, okay, I will admit, yeah. I have adopted some things from psychotherapy. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, but it's it, humans. It's yeah, behavior. That's what it is, yeah. You know, um, these are not, we are not robots that are just in and out. Yeah. you know uh, machines i mean we like to think that we are but yeah. um but yeah so i really had to take a detour outside of my uh curriculum outside of my education and learn a lot about human psychology and behavior because i said this is where everything's at that's how you're going to reach them yes. that's how you're going to connect and then i could simply apply the fundamental fundamentals of food eating in one's body uh, from based on what i know and what i've learned uh once they recognize and realize their own shortcomings or their own behaviors and why they're even doing those things. And most of the time, Roger, it's because they either have uh, instability in their life, whether it's with their family or a spouse or their job. And there's no way someone's going to sustain a diet yeah, at all whatsoever. So once I kind of, again, I shut up, I listen to what they have to say as weird or different as this sounds, I'm able to help them more. I had this one guy, he was a refinery worker, and he came to me because he got his blood work back and he was uh, almost, they call it borderline diabetes. Mm -hmm. But I, my belief is that you either have it or you don't. Right. But I understand what they mean by that is that you're getting close to it. Right. So it's somewhat of a scare and, tactic. And that's your when your A1C is like what? Um, elevated. Yeah. But but what is six what is point it? five or higher? Six point mm -hmm. five or higher. Okay. That's when uh, physicians start to get concerned that um, your body's just not handling uh, food as it once did. Right. Um, but <clears throat> that I can go into a whole uh, bit about diabetes and how we develop it and things of that nature. But uh, we'll we'll finish off with my counseling session. So I had this one guy who's working in the refineries. And so immediately I'm thinking, okay, these guys are getting up way early in the morning. They're probably commuting, you know, hour, two hours uh, back and forth. They probably have limited access to food, whether it's on site or at a takeout restaurant or something like that. So it's like, why am I going to start just saying, hey, you need to buy all organic food. You need to be bringing out your pots and pans and you know i gotta meet where they're at right? right but before i can even get there i need to learn about what is this person going through what is he thinking about um does he have family that he needs to take care of um and call them out too because people will quickly pay, quickly place agency on their family oh i can't work out because my that's, kids that's the biggest thing you know yeah, that's the biggest thing yeah. um and so just hearing their whole story basically i allow them to do that and then from there i start i further ask questions okay so why why is uh, an elevated a1c you know concerning for you 
because I want to hear why rather than, okay, well, your A1C is high. Okay, here's the food you need to eat. Here's what you need to do. Go do it. Right. right. That dude ain't going to do it for two weeks. So I, as much as it's, it's time consuming, it is, I'm not going to lie. Um, but I'm thinking like, I, I've, I've seen it. I've done it myself where I just hand someone a pay, piece of paper. They don't follow it and I never hear from them again. And so at the very least, even if I don't hear from them again, they at least know, damn, I remember he asked all those questions and I said all these things and at least they could reflect on it for for however long they want to it's almost like you're reverse engineering it right (laughs) like it's like you're getting them to reflect on well why am i worried about this well i might get diabetes well why is that a bad thing Mm -hmm. well i'm sure some people might not think it is a bad thing and then you have others that start to reflect and are like well shit if i get diabetes and i get sick and i've got a family i gotta take care of so then it starts bringing up the real the real whys that they have, Mm -hmm. which makes it easier to get them to understand why they need to really make those changes. Yeah, and then after that, we can nerd out on macros. We can talk about protein, carbohydrates, timing. We could talk about meals, preparing them. But again, I I first like to look at somebody as just as me. I have wants, desires, needs. You know, I have shortcomings. So I'm just going to talk to you like that first. I think that's why my patients there at dialysis love me so much because they're like, damn, like, He's not going to come around here and slap us across the face yeah. and say, why are you eating that damn taco again? Yeah. By the way, that was an expensive ass taco. Dude, I, I, I posted on uh, <laughs> I posted on Instagram earlier. I, I hate going to this restaurant, Cancun. And I'm going to oh, bash yeah. them. I don't give a shit. Food's decent. It's not good. I wouldn't call it good for Mexican food, right? And I go and I order my daughter a taco. And she just likes chicken fajita. Plain chicken fajita. Yeah. Dude, I go to pick it up and they're like, that'll be four sixty. I'm like Just one taco. One fucking taco. I'm like, that's a whole meal. Like I used Did to they, go to Mexican they, restaurants and get the, the potato uh potato egg or what was it? Like a, a potato a egg plate with potatoes, beans, and tortillas for like three ninety nine. Yeah. I'm like, I know price has gone up, but I'm it's, gonna pay ten dollars for two tacos. Like, that's fucking crazy, man. Yeah. You know, so which is another real problem nowadays. So, As a dietitian, I'm also having to now provide economic classes. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. Well, because- and and that's the crazy thing though is, and and this is probably something that will will probably gets on your nerves. But mm-hmm. why the hell is good food so expensive? Okay, why, yeah, that's know? a great topic. Um, I think it's the eye of the beholder, uh, and whether or not someone wants to again place agency on something. So are we really saying healthy food? First of all, we got to define healthy food. Right. Second of all, uh, that's a blanket statement across. We have access to so much food nowadays. There are different types of ways of preparation. What's expensive is the convenience factor of food. You go to HB and you buy that platter of chopped up fruits and vegetables. Hell yeah, yeah, it's expensive. You pay them to cut it. Because (laughs) the consumer said... We're lazy. Yes. We don't want to cut it up. My wife hates washing lettuce. I'm like, you're paying for an extra dollar fifty for something that's packaged yeah. that we can yeah. get so much more out of. And all mm-hmm. we got to do is run it through the damn uh, yeah. sink for a little so bit. So convenience know? is yeah. expensive. And that makes sense because like when you compare like, I know what you're saying. The, 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 the statement people say is like, it's, it's more expensive to eat healthy. And so it's like if you could like McDonald's, right? Something that's just trash food it's cheap right and you compare that to like going to another restaurant that's going to be healthy it's expensive but if you're talking about just buying groceries i mean if you're just buying chicken and rice like that's not that's not it's affordable you know Uh, and what people look at too is the total bill of their grocery okay haul that's what they look at but when you actually because we learned this in food service when you actually prepare the meal and you have all the ingredients put together and you divide that per the cost yes. of the total food, yeah. it's always cheaper. It yeah. Think it about is. it. A burger from wherever, whether right. it's a restaurant or McDonald's or Whataburger, you cook, you make that burger at home and you divide the cost for that burger, it's still cheaper. Yeah. Right. But right. I, I like to um, test conventional thought and phrases sure so when i hear things like oh healthy food is uh, why is it so expensive i'm like okay well let's 
pause and take some time to talk yeah. about it yeah. and get through instead like of what, just... I like what you said. Define what healthy food is. Like, what's healthy food first? Oh, and that's... then we see... Then so we can talk about cost. Yeah. I actually went down a rabbit hole here recently uh, as to define what health is. And I came back and I'm like, damn, I got a lot to talk about. <laughs> uh, because I don't believe in healthy food. I believe that food is food. And health is really a dynamic uh, state of our physical, our mental, and our social. Uh, and this is actually a, a working definition uh, in the literature. That's what they define health as. It's not just the food we eat, right? It's our, our mental uh, ability or capacity. If that goes to crap, what are we left with? We're mm -hmm. left with dementia. We're left with just going crazy. So that defined, that's a def uh, contributor to def what defines health. Another thing is our social. We're social creatures. Yes. If we don't partake in society, if we can't function well in society, um, all those things combined, we're either in a state of health or a state of disease. And I say dis-ease with purpose because that really is the crux of whether or not someone is healthy or not, is when all of these things in their life are imbalanced, then a person is a state of dis-ease. If things are, they're able to cope with the demands of life, they're in a state of health. And that's constantly changing throughout life. Oh. And so um, there's, a, I can point you out to a paper, it's called uh, Towards a Working Definition of Health. And the guy goes through talking about all the contributing factors to uh, what constitutes health or disease. And the crazy thing that is he just talks about, there's one line in nutrition and all, all it says is as long as you're getting adequate amounts of nutrition and then he moves on to the next stuff, which wow. is your physical, your, your social, uh, all these things that play a part of, I mean, think about it. We're stressed by 101 things. Yeah. Are we stressed about ketogenic? Yeah. On our day to day? Yeah. No, we're stressed yeah. about bills. We're stressed about family. We're stressed about spouse those things can contribute to disease eventually yeah and we don't realize that and i like to say is that we live in a very um we're, we're well off so what else are we going to complain about oh let's start complaining about our food really yeah. we have we have everything we need yeah. yes right yeah. now i'm not saying that you know we can overdo it or we can be consuming you know just ice cream and candy all day i mean but what person is other than a child or someone who actually never had any real feedback from other people uh most pe the reason i come at this position is because i like to think that humans are more capable than we give them credit right so someone knows okay what a what a quote unquote healthy diet looks like and what it doesn't but there's a reason why they're going to those foods the other foods and yeah. we talked about one yeah. convenience right why do why do any of us go through a drive through right it's not like we're like damn like i really sure that i'm not gonna lie the companies have also made food to be very tasty yeah i was yes. gonna say taste yes is, is the that, that's a big that's one a big right reason, yeah. but the cool thing too is that when you take out um you know the satisfaction part of food what do we boil it down to is a conditional need we need food to live yeah okay and one of the things that I really like that I've um, thought about for a while and I've implemented with some clients is, are you really hungry? And most of the time we're not. No, that's a great one, man. That's a great one. That one is so big. And it, that, that understanding has helped me so much. And fighting has yeah. helped me so much because I went, tw I've gone 24 hours without food. We took a trip not too long ago. That's what I would do with fighting, right? Mm -hmm. We'd go 24 hours. Uh, with hours before weigh-ins you know i'd be starving myself practically but we took a trip the other day and we were going out of town and we were just on the road going and i was like shit i ate my last meal at six o'clock it was eight o'clock yeah. the next day the next evening it had been 24 26 hours and i hadn't eaten and i was like but i was so focused on something else yes. that i didn't have time to feel those hunger pangs right yeah. like so that's that's i love that point this I is gonna change y'all's lives ready for this when you know you're actually hungry you know what tastes amazing? Bland chicken and rice. That's when you're legitimately physiologically hungry. And we never get to that point. And we never, yeah, get, to we that never point. get to that point. So, uh, but what, were we, what are we constantly bombarded by? You know, messaging of snack culture, 
oh, you need to eat every couple of hours and you're going to faint or you're going to have low. The amount of times I've heard somebody say, I have low blood sugar because they haven't ate in four hours. Is my, I would be a millionaire by this point. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But the truth is, is that we're saturated by food and yeah. it's, and it's an uphill battle. Yeah, it really is. And uh, again, every day I'm, uh, ch- um, I'm challenged by BS belief systems. And so that's probably the biggest uh, challenge when it's come, when it comes to working with everyone is uh, okay. What are their belief systems? If I can get to those very quickly, I at least can understand them. And then I can allow them to further discuss things and they can hear themselves and then they can get, we can come to a point where we're like, okay, now let's talk. Yeah. Yeah. So, and that's, you know, it's funny because you, you, like you said, we're, we have so much in reality, we've all got plenty of resources, right? Plenty. Nobody's going to starve if they don't eat no. 24 hours. Yeah. And I watched that, uh, that doctor. I forget his name, but he's the one that gives the, the severely, morbidly obese people. I forgot his I, name too. He's got a weird, yeah, he's got a weird uh, uh, voice. But this lady's like, I can't eat this. I can't. Eat. And he's like, you're not going to starve. Like, you can sit here without food for two weeks. Mm-hmm. You've you've spent, you know, you've been eating a certain way for the last 20 years. And you can literally live off what you're, you're reserved for. Like, you're, you're not. She was complaining because she didn't like the food there. Yeah. you know and he's like and i like him because he's straightforward like yeah. he don't yeah. give a shit he's not he's not he's worried kind of like we talked about earlier <clears throat> he's gonna put into people that really want to change mm-hmm. and those that don't he kind of tells them how it is and he'll kick them out mm-hmm. you know he'll kick them out uh, 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 from under his care so it's uh you know it's it's interesting when you you start listening to your body and and how you know those those hunger you know oh i'm hungry well so what is that? What is that then? Like, because we all fe- we've that, all had that. habit. Is it is it is it a mental thing? Because mm-hmm. obviously it's some kind of receptors in our stomach sure. telling our yeah. brain something, right? But where does that come from? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. So there's two types of hungers. There's the like you alluded to your mind, and then a physiological hunger. Hunger, and uh, again, we've probably been so uh abusive of those two things for decades now that no the average person probably doesn't even know what to tell the difference between either or and so for me it's really just understanding okay uh, if i was working with a a client who was having some issues managing their food intake and they didn't know whether they were hungry bored or depressed or whatever it was um i would again find out well what is this person What, what are they dealing with what kind of job do they have all those things are going to tell me, okay, this person is, well, I would love to hear it from them. Oh, well, I'm probably eating because of this. Where I didn't have to guess because I finally I got, yeah. he told me. Right. And so I was like, okay, well, now I could come in and offer him so, so, some solutions, some approaches. And that's up to him whether or not he wants to go through with those. Yeah. Um, but yeah, in terms of just determining the difference, uh, again, it, we've been so saturated with food that it's, we probably all lost touch with you, that. Your mind like plays tricks on you too, because it's like if you have to fast for like blood work or something, it's like I don't know why. It's like exactly. I'm so hungry. I, yes. I don't even. I wouldn't even. We we do a lot of like flat fasting in the morning. And stuff. Yes. Maybe don't eat breakfast. Maybe have a protein shake or something. And then it's like I'm doing a blood draw, and it's like why am I so hungry right yes. now? It's like that's, yeah. I do this every day. Well, and it's you not know, a, a better example for me was when I was on shift work. Uh, typically at the fire station we eat between five and six Mm -hmm. when i get home normally i eat a little later like nine o'clock and uh, because i'm i'm back from training and and that's usually my last meal although we're we're talking about changing that up i'm actually going to try and eat at five or six earlier just because it's easier for the family and they don't have to wait on me but then i'm gonna see how that works so i'll i'll be talking about that later but um for me at the fire station we would eat at five or six and then dude I'd be stuffed. Like I eat a whole ass steak or I get two plates of something. And then eight thirty, nine 9 o'clock comes around nine 30. I'm like snooping around the kitchen, like looking for, but that's your eat. normal home time eating. And, right. and that's the normal home time eating. But I know I'm not hungry, but dude, I would literally like, it would be torture for me to go to my rack and like, just fall asleep. Like <laughs> I'd have to like satiate myself with something, whether it's just a, <laughs> piece of bread with peanut butter or even a scoop that would that was always my go-to when i was fighting was like get a scoop of peanut butter and just it's got the fats it's gonna fill me up a little bit and it's gonna um 
give me that that sweetness that I'm looking for instead of that piece of cake that's sitting on the counter. You know what I mean? Yeah. So uh, I would do that. But yeah, it's it's crazy how powerful the mind can be mm -hmm. and both positive and negative for and you both yes. right um that's got to be like and, and it's so interesting the way you approach things because really you're, you're approaching them from a psychological yes. standpoint as opposed to just get, telling people what to do you're really trying to figure them out yeah i'm really trying to figure them out because again like you mentioned earlier people don't like to be told what to do humans don't like that at all whatsoever uh, in the realm of dieting, they, they believe that that's what they need, that they believe they want to be told what to do. Um, but in all actuality, people love to have uh, exert control and have a feeling, a, a sense of control in their lives. And so I just simply am aware of that. And I try to get them there and say, hey, look, I'm right here. Right. But I would prefer that you do this for yourself. Right. For the reasons that you know to be, you know, um, meaningful and productive in your life because what the hell do i know about your life or where you've been or why you even here in front of me so uh it's really important and now from an actual like biological or nutrition standpoint for me it's like number one i have i look at things like a uh, order of importance when it comes to actual nutrition okay is this person nourished you know, are they, do they have any deficiencies? So let's talk about that for a second. The first thing that I look for every human on this earth, okay, is are they getting enough? That's number one thing. Because if you're not, then you're going to die, right? And as we know, we live in a modern society of uh, food abundance. Yeah. So for most people outside of actual eating disorders, um, you're getting enough. Yeah. Let's start there. Yeah. And again, if people start to get scared, like, oh, well, if I don't eat every three hours, my low, I'm going to have low blood sugar, my blood pressure is going to be all over. Okay, let's test that theory if you're open to it. So to your point, let's do, do you feel like you would be down to fast for eight hours or start small? Yeah. Right. And uh, this is how you actually get to change someone's BS, their belief systems. You test the theory. And so their belief system is if I don't eat every three hours, my sugar is going to crash. and I'm going to die. Some people are like that. Yeah. We all know someone who's like that. Oh, yeah. And um, so this patient I was, or this client I was working in particular, I said, would you be open to that? And he said, sure, fine. As long as you uh, stay on call. I was like, yes, I'll answer the phone if you're dying. <laughs> and he's like, okay. So he, he ended up fasting for eight hours. And we made like a gamify out of it. Like and he's probably never done that in his life. Yes. But like that's Well, at of least he thinks yeah. he hasn't right 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 yeah, again point. going yeah. back to bs yeah and um so we did and we did a we had we shared like a timer so it was showing the hours that would go by and um I've, i told him you know, like fill your eight hours with things that you enjoy whether it's playing video game whatever what you want he said okay and uh, you report to me any well on the top of every hour every two hours however you want to do it and he did, and he finally got to eight hours, and he said, Josh, I'm not done. Can we do nine? I said, yeah, let's do it. He ended up fasting for 16 hours. Nice. Double on his first yeah. day. Yeah. On his first day. And it wasn't because we were doing this protocol or anything. It was really just to test his fear of, and again, it sounds like freaking psychotherapy, of that he felt he couldn't go past you know, a certain amount of hours to eat. And ever since then, he adopted a... a he decided that he wanted to adopt a fasting style approach to his food. And uh, he was able to lose, I remember this clearly, uh, 18 pounds for, for his uh, particular goals. And he was able to sustain that and manage his, uh, he had two kids and he has two kids and a wife. And uh, he wanted to start working out as well. And he was able to start implementing that as well. So all it took was this scared person of fearing that he got it from somewhere. Right. That he, that's the other thing that I'm constantly trying to work through as well. Well, and especially being Hispanic, like you got, you, you understand our culture with, you know, Welita there trying to uh, finish like hear me whole, eat, here, eat more. Oh, and then, yeah. and then that's the other thing. Yeah. It's like, and we talked about it with Santos where it was the same thing with his family. You, you, I remember mom told me a story one time about her grandfather. He would get her whatever she wanted to eat, but she had to eat it all. And they literally, she, she ordered two pancakes one time at this restaurant and they said, that's fine, but you better eat it all. 
Well, they brought her the pancakes. They were so big. They were over like the plate. Oh. And she was literally, she told me a story. She was literally crying. And they were like, finish it. And it's just that toxicity. And of course, she was overweight her whole life. Well, number one, yeah. wonder why, right? It's like, you know, my grandpa would pull trash bags. Oh, man, this is kind of funny and, and embarrassing at the same time. But he would pull whatever we didn't eat, mm-hmm. the water burger, whatever. He would pull it out of the, the, ba- the trash can. Like, it's still in the bag, but, yeah. and he would, if there were fries or ketchup or salt packets, he would take them out. So I got to a point where I'm like, hey, grandpa, I'm, I left my food here, you know, and I would just leave it on the counter. Okay, well, that's fine. And maybe part of that is because he was a cheap ass. I mean, he was. So that's, love him, that, but, that might be more like you want to see food go to waste. Like, oh, he's not even hungry right, and he's going to eat it because but he what, can't. But like he's saying, like, you don't know what these people experience, right? Yeah. So now he's doing that. It's leading to Oh, uh, him being overweight, his habits, his dietary habits are leading to his issues. So now, you know, later on down the road, he's passing those on to my family members, and it's just, it's a, it's a, it's just a toxic cycle that that we see for generations. Yeah, and trust know? me, Roger, I would love to just print out a nice diet plan for everyone and pass it out and be done with it and yeah. get paid millions. Yeah, yeah it'd be easy. So you know, and but, I'm, I'm glad we're having this talk, man, because I really am. I feel like you know. Uh, this is happening at the right time, especially with the cadets, because I'm hard on them um, because there are some guys that do need to lose weight. But now what this does is this I, I need to sit those guys down. I need yeah. to actually like talk to them and say, OK, what's going on? What's preventing you? Why are you not able to? Um, because I can sit there and say, you guys need to work out more. You need to eat right. Don't eat bad, which is what I've been doing. Mm-hmm. But the and there's some that it will help. Sure. Because, you know, it's mm-hmm. just their lack of discipline yeah. that is stopping Absolutely. them. And now they have somebody holding them accountable. Yes. But there's also going to be those other ones that are struggling Mm -hmm. and that have other things going on um, that are really preventing them from being successful. Yeah. No, I agree. Uh, I think for the most part, people know what they need to be doing. And then they give themselves a hard time for not doing it. We do it all the time, even including ourselves. Right? So I kind of operate in that. I take that position. Is This person knows what they should be doing. But... Maybe they can't even help themselves at this point. So that's where we come in. Yes. Whether it's they need more discipline or accountability or they need a, a different approach or they need to be their BS test. They're ch- challenged. Yeah. Do we need to test that? So I'm constantly trying to identify those things. Well, what exactly is this person in need of? Because they're not in need of a diet per se. They're in, in need of some type of transformation. I don't know yet. And we're about to find out. Mm-hmm. So That's awesome, man. That's awesome. Well, you know, you, you got into the fasting thing, and that's mm-hmm. something that, like you said, we, we did, um, or we do, you know, because there'll be days where I, I eat my last meal at 9 o'clock, and then I don't eat my first meal until after a first workout of the day, so it'll be like 1 or 2 o'clock. But what what is your, what do you suggest, or I shouldn't say suggest, what do you think is the best um results that you're going to see from fasting as far as like window is it 10 hours i've heard 12 hours i heard the magic starts happening at 16 hours i heard oh when you hit 24 hours then you really feel alive and i'm like shit man what what you could fire bend at 24 hours yeah Yeah. that's what i'm saying it's like man what you know um speaking as from a professional you Mm -hmm. know give us some feedback on on that okay so i guess what is the benefit that someone's trying to get out of it what, what would as far as far as weight loss oh weight loss okay uh so that's that's a great question i like that question because um in terms of weight loss first we got to define or figure out well how does one how does a person how's the human body lose weight and it really comes down to the uh, amount of energy that is coming in and the amount of energy that is going out now in practice that's complicated as hell yes In theory, that's wonderful, right? Easy, right? Calories in, calories out (laughs) type of bullshit. Yes. Um, but I thought you said you didn't like math. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) I try to stay away from it as much as possible. But science pulls me back into math. They're they're closely related. Um, But no, so again, if someone's fasting for any amount of hours, when are they going to eat again? And how much of they're going to, are they going to eat again? And if that is going over their... A caloric maintenance then yeah they're just going to be maintaining that mass indefinitely so you could fast all you want but if you are in a constant caloric maintenance 
then you're not going to really change any tissues in your body, whether fat mass or muscle mass. So again, it's really just identifying, okay, I can fast for all these benefits, whether it makes me feel good mentally, whether I have more alertness, alertness, other benefits, other benefits from it. But again, I do have to come back to eating. So I kind of position it that way. If someone's coming to me and they enjoy fasting is okay, well, do, do your fast, do you, but at the same time, what kind of meals are you having? You know, how are they looking like? Are they structured with protein, carbohydrates, and fats in the ways that you enjoy it? Or do you have the foods that you like? How are you preparing them? And if we can position that person to be in a caloric deficit, then fast all you want. We have your meals set in for you. We have your plan in front of you. That's the key that's going to lose the weight. Yeah. Not necessarily the fasting. Mm-hmm. The, ca- the, the calories. Mm-hmm. Well, now, and then we get to a, a, this is where we start getting into it, right? Because here's the thing. I know people that are fasting and then they get off their fast and they're hardly eating, right? Yeah. But then they'll have a bag of chips and a Coke or six beers, or six white claws because those are low, low carb, right? <laughs> yeah. Like you can have white claws. They're yeah. low calorie, low carb. Correct. And then. It's your BS system. Uh, yeah. And then, <laughs> but they're still, now they're still under mm-hmm. their calories. Mm-hmm. So they're going to lose a little bit of weight, mm-hmm. right? But what is the tipping point usually for that? Because that's not a healthy thing to do. Yeah. Well, first we want to understand why the hell are they eating that way? Right. You know, because uh, again, they're doing it for reasons. Reasons that I don't even know yet. So whether or not it's healthy or not, I mean, like until they understand why they're deciding to go uh, lay out their diet in this fashion, then we're not going to get anywhere. Yeah. Well, it's because I think, and I know people, are, I'm actually giving the diet of people I know. But, <laughs> yeah. but, but the thing about it is like most of the time it's like people want to lose weight, mm-hmm. right? So they start working out. Mm-hmm. They want to feel better about themselves. And then they hear about fasting and all, mm-hmm. oh, and this person said they fasted and it, it, I know it's fasting is really good for you. Sure. And then, so they get off their fast and they eat a little salad with, you know, grilled chicken. Mm-hmm. But then, like I said, they're drinking or they have their snacks mm-hmm. and they still think, oh, I just can't, you know, I had my one little bag of chips or like my, my snicker bar and I say, hey, it stayed under my calories. It's like, yeah, but you not getting any nutrients yeah like you're not getting real food because of the way you're doing it so it, it's hard because they, oh i'm losing weight but it's like yeah you're losing weight but you're not doing it the right way sure and yeah well and it's i couldn't really tell them i couldn't really convince them that right i think that's the biggest thing is look when you're ready to have a conversation about the way your chaotic uh food choices are right then we'll talk well you know let's plan man i'm ready to go let's talk about you know filling your diet more with protein the foods that the protein foods that you like let's talk about structuring your carbohydrates throughout your day but until then i mean again it's like i gotta i gotta ask you this because this is a big question Mm -hmm. how much and this y'all are gonna hate me for this. All you girls out there, <laughs> all you all all you guys that think you put in the work, here's the thing. Mm-hmm. Okay, how much is alcohol going to um halt or stop your progression as far as weight loss? How big of an impact does it have mm-hmm. on you? So the crazy thing is is that alcohol within it of itself is actually not fattening. It's all the associate or side effect behaviors that come with it which is the water burger after the bars, okay. which is the um, inebriation of someone and they do these crazy stuff, right? That's really where you're going to see the halt. They're going to lose uh, 50% of their strength the next day. We know that alcohol does that. Mm-hmm. So it's all those things and it gets that person into that lazy effect the next day to where they're not moving around. So what happens when that occurs? They bring down their energy expenditure down to a level where now they're maintaining their caloric intake and so then that now they're no longer in a deficit yeah so it's really again all those side effects because your body sees alcohol as a a toxin right so it's trying to get rid of it so there's really nothing staying there in regards to alcohol so inherently alcohol is unfattening it's all the other things that are associated around it that do contribute to that so as long as i include my alcohol intake into my macros i'm good to go you're good to go but again we're talking about strictly from a weight loss plateau correct 
Yes. And that, that leads me to the next question because I saw something that said when it comes to muscle building, mm-hmm. if you drink alcohol, it's – and this is TikTok. Sure. Bro, but bro, you got shit science. on TikTok, so, so it, it, <laughs> yeah. it, you know, how, how uh, accurate is this? Yes. But in your opinion, and, and what, I, what I saw was it up to 72 hours, it stops muscle growth mm-hmm. if you consume alcohol. Mm-hmm. Now, I – don't know the amount of alcohol it sure. was talking about. I don't know if it was, you know, a glass of wine or if it was, mm-hmm. but it said for, you know, up to 72 hours, it can do that. Yeah. So really anything uh, in nature, whether it's alcohol, food or any type of substance, there's, I look at, I like to look at it as a bell curve, right? So most things are okay in certain doses, right? Even alcohol, they call it a, a hermetic effect or hormesis. That just means that a little bit can provide a little bit of benefit because it's a stressor, puts stress on the body. Uh, yes. But yes. once you pass that limit, then it becomes counterproductive right. or potentially deadly. Yeah. Right. So you drink too much alcohol, you will die you yeah. know, from poisoning. You can drink too much water too and die. Everything exactly, <laughs> exactly <laughs> to his point. Yeah. So, um, so you're making me feel a lot better about these beers I'm about to have after. <laughs> <laughs> well, just get me one. Make sure you get me. <laughs> there we go. Uh, no, so. In terms of the, that's the thing about TikTok and information is that all these numbers and all these crazy ideas about 72 hours and this and that, I just take it with a grain of salt. And all I look at it is, yes, it's going to impact muscle repair and growth. For 72 hours, 14 hours, it doesn't matter. But as long as as we're armed with that information, it's up to us to make that decision from there. Like, I can't stop you. From, or anyone from chugging six beers or even 10 shots Saturday night, right. that's a personal decision. That's res- personal responsibility. Right. So uh, all I can do is be like, hey, look, yes, if you're going to drink, here's how you probably can approach it for the goals that you're telling me that you have. Right. Because I've worked with athletes. I've worked with you know, uh, fitness competitors, you know, and they still are partaking in this thing called life. Yes. Where they want to have some beverages on the weekend with their friends or family and whatnot. But it's like, hey, you still are focused and you still want to get to your goals. Okay, so let's let's plan. Let's uh, strategize for this rather than just be chaotic with it. Right. And that's something that I think I've always done. And I know he does with like when with your eating. Right. It's like if we're going to have cheat meals or something, mm-hmm. it's like we're we're planning for that. So if I knew I ate the freaking a whole large pizza the night before mm-hmm. then i'm gonna hit legs hard as hell and so i'm gonna fast so yeah so we're, but we're 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 planning appropriately to take in those extra calories that we're gonna do we're gonna do extra cardio or we're gonna do a really hard workout and then we're gonna add some fasting to it mm-hmm. but we're definitely not just gonna do one thing on top of the other on top of it now don't get me wrong i have weekends where we go out of town and it's and we tell each other like dude we i like shit this weekend mm-hmm. and so when we come back it's like we're on it yeah but the problem is i think people they take they they take part in those activities and they're not really earning it per se or doing the extra uh, preparation to make sure that hey this is not going to affect you as bad as as it has yeah or as it could be as it could be and the other thing too is that i don't put a lot of pressure on myself or anyone because think about it is if you're an outsider and i say outsider for those who really don't care to exercise, really don't care to look at their nutrition. They've ne- never been in anything competitive in their life. And they see us guys and they're like, damn, like that's too much pressure. I don't want to yes. even like jump on that side of things. The reason I'm saying this is because it's like, we're just like you. We're just like everyone else. Absolutely. You know, and that I think that approach or that position just makes everybody a little bit more comfortable to be like, hey man, uh, I see that you exercise, you know. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about your program or something rather than like, man, I'm always in the gym 24 yeah. seven. I eat clean every hour on the yeah. hour. I, man, if I see donuts, I'm just going to puke. Like who wants to live that yeah. way? Yeah. yeah. So I think that's kind of been something that I've kind of evolved over the last seven to 10 years in my uh, career. And as a professional is like, look, man, I'm just like you. Yeah. Um, here there are better approaches and if you'd like to learn about them then cool let's let's do this well i like i like the idea that you have there or the mindset that you have i should say um because i I was 
listening to one of your um reels that you posted on instagram and it was like like something to the effect of you know you have to still take part and like enjoy certain aspects of life Mm -hmm. like you want to make sure that you're you're taking care of yourself but taking care of yourself is also not completely depriving yourself of every enjoyment and luxury and let's face it food we are in a very um spoiled and like you said over we have there's an overabundance of food Mm -hmm. and food is a luxury where we live food is not a necessity food is a luxury where we live and part of being here and obtaining a certain income and being able to take your family out to a nice meal Mm -hmm. is part of being healthy mm-hmm. you know and exactly sometimes you might not eat the best foods when you're doing that mm-hmm. but the mental side of it and that's what i've always said like sometimes it feels like having a beer and just drinking a beer and and sitting back and relaxing it does more for my mental than mm-hmm. anything else yeah. right and so if i'm gonna sacrifice um uh, 200 calories to have two beers like but it's gonna have been it's been a long stressful week or whatever. It's gonna help me up here more than anywhere else, and exactly. that's that's just as important as what I put into my body as far as food wise. Mm-hmm. You know? Now, if I did have to share, you know, a I guess a risk for alcohol consumption and the health of it, uh, if I had to provide a recommendation, and you could easily look this up at, on any you know website that's respected a society or whatever, um, it would be. From what I've read, what I've come across, and what I've learned, probably be about one beer a day. One beer a day. Mm-hmm. So that can would I be save that, can that I... therapeutic level, like before you hit the bell curve. Like that would be the where it's still there's some benefits and it's not yeah. gonna. Yeah. So is that like I drink, I save all those beers, and on Sunday I hit seven. <laughs> well, the, <I> mean, <laughs> no, that, that right that. that that's called boy math. Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. No, uh, so that it's. That's why they they specify uh, per day, yeah, because it's within a given day. Okay. So if you were to clump that all in in one one bout, yeah. which many people do, right? Yes. Especially after St. Patty's this past weekend, I'm oh, sure. Oh yeah. Um. Yeah, that probably wouldn't wouldn't be so great either. Right. Um. But yeah, really, and then not only that, the other thing is called uh, the biological lottery. There's some yes. people who just have livers of steel. Yeah. And there's another there's other people who are unfortunate and they drink just for a year and they end up with liver cirrhosis. Yeah. Yeah. So well, and it's not just that it's just like with the food, right? It's the same thing. I know guys well, that that's eat whatever gonna, the that's fuck what I was they gonna want. say the genetics part of it, like mm-hmm. you've heard the term carb sensitive. Is that a is that a thing? I mean, is how is someone carb sensitive or is that their diet over? I call it the tortilla their... gene. I got the tortilla. <laughs> I ate a tortilla, I gained like five pounds, so I gotta make sure and hit it hard. Well, the the good news, though, is that say someone does have that. We know that exercise is probably the best thing that they could do right. to combat that lack of okay. sensitivity. Okay, I have another myth question. Can you outwork a bad diet? Oh, okay. Oh, man, I don't. I hate these cliches or but, these but, phrases. But, but you know what I'm saying? Like yeah. because of the, well, I mean, I know you know what I'm saying, but as far as like the whole thing brings us to that topic of the tortilla gene or the mm-hmm. carb sensitive whatever it's like well as I'll long as you, i work out hard i'll, like, I'll just this. eat whatever i want and when i was young i almost i think i was living that way for a long time but as we've gotten older uh okay this is my answer uh do you know uh dj metcalf yes yes have you seen his diet or heard of his diet uh ocho cinco you ever heard of his diet no at mcdonald's yeah. all three meals yeah. well it's so, like floyd mayweather right like so to three, answer your question yes Professional athletes can do that. Yes. Yeah. yes. Can can yes. outperform or outrun out, a diet. The average person is not <laughs> no. working out. And that's something that I, 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 I was telling the cadets because I said, some of you guys have never pushed yourself to be uncomfortable. I had somebody telling me, well, sir, can I change weights because my shoulder's burning. I said, is it hurting? Is it like feel like it's going to pop or tear? He goes, no, it's kind of burning. I said, that's what happens when you fucking push yourself. That's called the pump. It's called the that's pump. Good. You're good. Burn. That's you're good. Gonna, you're gonna fucking love that. To learn that. <laughs> love that shit. You know. Yeah. And uh, but but that's the thing is like some people. I mean, you have to if you're gonna eat like that. Yeah, you're yeah. gonna have to. And but yes, you can. Yeah, you can. Yeah. But for the average person, to your point, yeah, no, it's not gonna happen. Now, uh, now something that that we have talked about before, and we've got 
friends that are on it and this is so hard especially with women you know everybody's looking for the magic pill correct well now there's a magic pill but it's not really a healthy magic pill in my opinion but you know these these diet pills this ozempic pill that's out there to help people um you see these people get on it and they start losing all kinds of oh, i got to prove for it i they start losing all kinds of weight but the last time we had talked we were like yeah but they're not they're not actually looking at okay am i just losing fat or am i losing muscle with the fat or am i just losing muscle like and then i always call it you you see those people that get on and they get skinny fat mm -hmm. right they have the their skinny bodies and there's no muscle tone mm -hmm. there's no definition it's just it's just flabby and yeah. soft and i mean what is your take on diet pills ozempic all that stuff yeah so uh actually one of my coworkers started that therapy and she got approved for it and everything and um, i hadn't been keeping up with it to be honest until she shared it with me and she was like asking me okay josh like what does it do like and i said okay i'll look it up so i finally looked it up this was probably about two months ago oh, okay and basically what ozempic does and the similar um, injections is it basically tells your brain that you're not as hungry and then it also helps with your insulin and it helps manage your blood sugars which is originally meant for patients yeah, with diabetes right, yeah. um, but then obviously the industry got a hold of it and said aha we could use this as a weight loss yes. uh, injection and obviously it went rampant and everybody started using it so for me it's really well yeah, people want weight loss. So, of course, they're going to buy it. Of course, they're going to consume it. And there's nothing that I'm going to do to tell them otherwise. Other than, again, if someone comes to me and say, hey, look, I'm taking Ozempic. Um, Josh, what do you think are ways I could sustain this after the fact or during or whatever the case? Then I'm going to pour all myself into them. If they want it for all these reasons that we're describing, then, again, there's nothing I could change about their mind. They're going to do it. Mm -hmm. So it's basically an appetite suppressant as far as the way it works on, mm -hmm. on the body. Yes. Yeah. So that's why when people do it and mm -hmm. then they get off it. So it, it's so amazing. Like it, it's blowing my mind right now because it's really not as difficult as we're making it. No. Right. It's it's about the calories that you're taking mm -hmm. and having having those calories, whatever kind of diet you're on or, or lifestyle you're living, mm -hmm. like having that be sustainable mm -hmm. and you don't see that with these because what they're doing is they're cutting their calories so drastically that mm -hmm. they start losing the weight. But then when they get off it, they start eating more and it might be a slow thing from what I've seen. It's not like an instant blow sure. up. Yeah. It's a gradual cause they, they go from maybe eating a thousand calories a day and now, okay, after they're on it, they're eating 1500 mm -hmm. for a couple of weeks and that 1500 goes up to 1800 and then 2000. And then they don't even realize, well shit, now you're eating you know, 3,000 calories yes. a day yeah. and the weight is back. Yes. And it's worse. And it's so worse. When individuals lose weight and they have weight regain, um, we know that they gain not just the same amount of weight, but they gain even more and it's harder to get rid of the weight that they put on again. Listen why, why to is, that. Why is that? Why is it harder to get rid it's of it? It's just uh, basically the, the way the body works and the physiology behind it is that essentially just to dumb it down it's your body's now more stubborn mm. the next time around yeah because we failed to manage that for more life. resistant yeah. for it to mm -hmm. be uh, what, what yeah. about age how much does age have an effect uh, an effect because you always hear <clears throat> excuse me you always hear the older you get the harder it is mm -hmm. now i feel part of that is because the older you get the harder it is to move correct which is to burn calories yeah. and but is it is that what is that the only thing or it does the metabolism you hear you hear that term all the time right yeah. i'm old now my metabolism yeah. slowed down yeah. how I, you know is that very little impact very little yeah, impact, very little impact. Wow. it's always going to come down to again those uh really those low hanging fruits which is you know uh at, do i still include physical activity or and or exercise into my lifestyle even at the ages of 60 70 and 80 in the way that they can right um am i still you know moving around outside of those bouts of exercise you know am i still active around the home and so forth or am i just sitting on a chair all day Co uh, coupled with the fact that yes energy needs are probably going to go a little bit lower for you know elderly folks 
And so, but then again, we're hearing this from people who are 40. Yes. Right? Yes. So here's that little agency thing coming back around again, wanting to place agency on a thing, which happens to be metabolism. Yeah. Man, so it's... anybody who can quickly place it on something or someone, then I'm like, okay, we got work to do. No. Yeah. That's amazing, man. I'm, I'm glad I'm glad we brought you on today because you're really dispelling, dispelling a lot of the, the, um, bs that's yeah. out there yeah you know i that's love that term is. i yeah. love that term yeah. because that's that's awesome but yeah man that's that's those are some of the things that i hear people talk about and the, the things that i've heard people struggle with and and in reality to me it's always been like an accountability factor right mm -hmm. i'm i've always said like i don't care about washboard abs i think six packs are overrated that's just my my opinion right mm -hmm. because i can't get them and walk around with them genetically <laughs> uh -uh, but for me, it's always been about like, how can you function? Can I still move with my kids? You know, being 40 years old and having a daughter, like when she's 20, if she wants to go out and go for a jog, like I still want to be able to fucking move with her. Mm -hmm. And if I don't lay that foundation, which I've already laid, right? But mm -hmm. if I don't keep it up, yeah. which is the difficult part, then I'm not, it's not going to be there. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to be able to do those things. I'm not going to be able to experience, you know, with my grandkids, if, if you know, I hope I'm still around with them. But if I'm not able to go throw the ball and go do those kind of things, like, you know, I want to be able to enjoy life to the fullest. Mm -hmm. And part of that is just taking accountability for my nutrition and my lifestyle now. Mm -hmm. And um, I think there's so many people out there that are doing exactly what you say. You know, you call it, um, what, what do you call it? Agency? Mm -hmm. Like they put agency on something yeah. else and, and essentially it's just accountability, yeah. right? It's mm -hmm. a lack of people looking at themselves and yep. saying, this is what I need to do yep. and this is what I'm not doing. Mm -hmm. And I'm putting it on everybody else mm -hmm. and my situation. And that's what I tell people. I said, look at your life. Like m we talked to Santos about it and we said, what are the three things people like blame on not being able to work out? Mm -hmm. And it was always, you know, kids, kids, time and work or, or something like that. But kids, it's like, okay, well, God forbid something happened, but you're always going to have your kids oh, exactly. until they're 18, yes. right? You're always going to have your job unless you win the lottery. Yeah. So like, let's figure out a solution. Exactly. Right. Let's figure out a solution. And I think that's where you really come in with, with helping people manage okay, this is your schedule because you had brought up the refinery workers and, and it's exactly, I have friends that were, I have friends in the refinery and that's one of the things they say, they say, dude, the guys there, they bring tacos and they eat like shit. And, but I know some guys that are in the refinery and they still, they pack their own lunches. Mm -hmm. They go eat or, or they, uh, they go work out before or after their shift, like as tired as they are, they're still putting in the work. Mm -hmm. So they're still getting the work done and managing the calories to, to, to have the physiques that they have. Yeah. But it becomes a thing of societal, not societal, environmental norm, mm -hmm. right? And we see it in the fire department. Yeah. We get, we get a fire and our rookies and we tell them cake and ice cream, bring cake and ice cream. You know, your first day on shift, bring some snacks, bring some goodies. It's sure. not like, Hey, cook up everybody some acai bowls or something. It's like bring donuts and bring yeah. cake and ice cream. And it's just a, uh, it's it's something that we've got to break. It's a it's a, a cultural, a, a battle, cultural battle that fight. we have to kind of fight through mm -hmm. to get to these individuals because some of them are in their forties and fifties and been fighting it their whole life. Yeah, you know, and that's you know that's not easy to do. No, it's yeah. not. And I will say though, as uh, being seven years in studying nutrition and going to school for, I came out of all of that to realize and understand that the most powerful thing that you can do is actually exercise. Exercise actually gives you a lot more freedom in terms of not only feeling a better, um, you know, preventing uh, chronic diseases over time, uh, keeping your mental health uh, across your lifespan, um, being functional, as you mentioned, but also being able to handle the food that you're eating. Yes. Um, I talked about it in my last one where um, we know that when you exercise, it actually tells your body where to place that food. And that when I learned about that uh, in terms of where what exercise actually does in the body, it blew my mind. So when you exercise, we have these storage tanks in our body. We call them uh, 
muscle. And within the muscle, we have what we call glycogen. I'm pretty sure y'all have heard of it mm-hmm. before. And so those basically are a reservoir or tanks, as I like to call them, for sugar. Okay, that's all primarily that's what's stored in it. There's a little bit of lipids or fat in there, but the only way you can tap into those stores is guess through what exercise Exercise. Exercise. or enough physical activity, but you'd have to be walking for miles. Yeah. Which people used to do back in the days. Yes. And so if those storages are never um, decreased at an appreciable amount, guess what's going to happen? And you continue to eat. There's going to be no room for that there that to go, uh, the extra food that's coming in. And so what's going to happen is it's going to start to be stored in the wrong places if someone's not exercising. And so at first it'll get stored into your adiposity tissues, right? You get more fat. No shit. Then after that, your glycogen storages are t- topped off. Your adipose tissues are topped off. We call that a personal fat threshold, meaning how much somebody can gain until they start to develop um, metabolic syndrome, which is uh, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, potential for stroke, so forth. That's where disease comes in. Yes. So once that person passes their personal fat threshold, and the crazy thing is we don't know what that is. For everybody. It's different, different for everybody. It's yeah. different for everyone. So that's why you've, you've heard or probably seen a 400, 400 pound person who doesn't have type 2 by diabetes. Yes. And we're like, what the hell? He should have all types of stuff. Then you see a 180 pound guy and he's got it. Yes. And he's got it. And again, this is part of the biological lottery. And um, so anyways, the point is, is that once we reach our personal fat threshold and we're not exercising and we continue to ingest all sorts of calories, I don't care if it's even from avocados, that starts to get stored in the the uh, vital organs, which the is organs. the liver, the pancreas, the heart, you name it. And that's where there's a downstream effect and it causes inflammation throughout the body. And you start to develop um, tears in your blood vessels, which leads to cardiovascular disease, potential for stroke and type two diabetes, because now your muscles are pretty much useless at that point. Man, that's, that's But if I could tell anyone, I would say exercise is actually the magic pill. Right. It's been in our lives and in our face for all these years. Yet, yeah. to your point, we're still going after all these other uh, things that are just short term. Yeah, we got reality. we got people that don't want to diet, um, or I'm sorry, they they'll they'll diet. They don't want to exercise. And they don't see any results. And mm-hmm. It's because of the output, and that's one thing I've always said. And one of our buddies, um, Oscar Longoria, <laughs> my boy O, uh, he always makes fun. He he's gaining a little bit of weight, but he always makes fun of me and, and our other friend uh, Homer. Uh, because he always tells us, he goes, you go, you, you guys are fat boys too, man. He said, I just, I can't wait till y'all, uh, y'all blow an ankle. He goes, then y'all going to gain all that weight back, you know, Be- because he, he, and he said it, he's like, y'all got to work out like 30 times a week to, to maintain. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, my diet has gotten a lot less strict now than when I was fighting, mm-hmm. but I've been and able to And you can make- get away with more now. You know, because of the foundation that was laid, mm-hmm. right? So that foundation is laid and now, and I'm still active. I'm still rolling. Mm-hmm. Now I, and, and I always worried because I was like, man, what if some of what he's saying is right? What if I do got to maintain this freaking crazy workout regimen just so that I don't, you know, uh, blow up. But what I've found is the older I've gotten, I've worked out less. Yep. The workouts are more, um, what I, what I do with them is more focused, mm-hmm. But they're not, you know, I'm not rolling in the gym for an hour and a half anymore. Mm-hmm. I might go in and get 30 minutes. Mm-hmm. And I've been able to maintain yeah. with still lifting weights four times a week, mm-hmm. doing cardio, maybe one of those sessions. Um, I'm, I'm definitely not working out seven times a week the way I was. Yeah. And I'm still eating, you know, rel- shit, I had chicken and waffles this morning, mm-hmm. you know. Now, I don't eat like that every day, but being active has allowed me to kind of maintain that yeah and i like to also provide an encouraging message to people is like um anything more than zero is better Mm -hmm. as well um you know we're not going to have everyone who can just go out there and you know be this crazy tarzan and exercise in seven days a week man if there's someone who's overweight and uh he's at risk for diabetes i'm just going to say hey man let's set a walking goal uh step count goal for you yeah let's start there you know because if he's in, in in the beginning at least in any way discouraged 
you know how those people are. They're going to be like, why even bother? Right. When they get to the why bother point in their head, there's no, we lost them. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And they're probably pretty much written off for, for disease in the future, which is unfortunate. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas again, I choose to have this approach and this message to them. It's like, no, let's, uh, let's go for a walk and let's talk about it. And, you know, uh, maybe that person will be a little bit encouraged to uh, come back again and say, hey, man, I, I, I um, had a step count of 4,000. I've never done that before. It's like, great. Like, let's let's see what we can get more. And then they start seeing their blood sugar levels go down. I actually have this happen to one person about two weeks ago. He was so excited because he hit 10,000 steps mm-hmm. and he had never done it. And uh, he says it's, he's checking his sugars now and they're way lower than where they were. And just by walking. Yeah. yeah, I didn't need him to do you know two a days and seven days a week. Uh, now we can get to a point where he finds a sustainable routine. He's starting to lift weights and he actually enjoys it. Yeah. And he could do that until he's 80, 80, 90 years old. Yeah. But if I try to crush him right off the bat, no, it's not going to help. Oh, and that's why those those Forget shows, it. man those those shows like The Biggest Loser. That was probably one of the most worst shows that you could have for somebody that's actually watching that's that's overweight because they see these people. They go on these crazy diets. They have these personal trainers that are pushing them. But then they go on their own. And what happens? They they always gain the weight back. Like you hear the horror stories of these people. And like you said, they gain more. Yeah. And and so, you know, one thing we've always preached. Because we have firefighters that exactly like they see us. And they're like, oh, can't do what you guys do. We don't expect you to do what we do. But we expect you to do something. Yeah, get You better. should start doing something. You got to get better. And I tell the cadets, I say, you're 110%. Is different than his hundred and ten percent, and it's different. His it's going to look different. He's going to be able to lift more. He's going to be able, there. She's going to be able to run faster. They're going to be able to do do this better. But I need a hundred and ten percent effort, mm-hmm. and I require nothing less because I need to know that you guys want to be better. And of course, there's going to be those that are giving me that, and, and we've got some that they don't even realize it because I don't let them. But man, they inspire me mm-hmm. because I see the effort that they're putting in, and they might be one of the weaker, weaker links that we have. Mm-hmm. But the effort that they have that wants to get better, they're gonna they, they're gonna get strong at some point. Yeah. It's just that desire, and we all have that. And and we, the hard part is getting people to realize that you have it inside you, mm-hmm. like it's in there. We just gotta pull it out, and we gotta figure out ways to do it. So. You know, definitely something we tell people is like, hey, just start with a walk around the station. Mm-hmm. Start with a walk around the block. You walk can't after run. You, walk like, after you eat. We walk, walk after up. you eat. Oh, I love that. Then, yeah. Walk for 10 minutes. Yeah. yeah. You leave a restaurant, like walk down. To, you're, you parked over here. Walk the other way. 10 minutes. Walk back. And it's yeah. like, Don't just, take the elevators. Take yeah. the stairs. Like those little things that get people just moving a little bit more and making them realize. Because I, I think once they hit that point where they realize, I can do it. Mm-hmm. Like once you get somebody to realize that. Once you get somebody to realize I can do it, man, it oh, it changes the world. Yeah, it changes the world. No, I agree with that as well. And and we're also a product of our environment. Um, you know, with modern civilization, and we don't really have uh, the parks that we once had, and ability to walk around. And yeah, we're all in cars now, oh. so it's like, man, we're up against a huge Everything. battle. Yeah. Everything, but always. that ain't gonna change, and mm-hmm. it's gonna get worse. Exactly. Yeah. So you know, people bitch, us. people bitch about the kids and stuff, and about. You know, video <clears throat> games, they're always on. Mm-hmm. Well, okay, that's not going nowhere. Mm-mm. Technology is here to stay and it's mm-hmm. going to get worse. So what we need to do is do our best as parents to keep them as active and involved as we can. And that means we got to get off our ass and stop letting everybody else uh, parent our kids. Mm-hmm. Then that's what we got to do, yeah. right? So you talked about a uh, drive through convenience. Now there's DoorDash. You don't have to, oh, leave. Shit, you you don't have to, have to get leave. up. You got this. people that don't have to leave. <laughs> Just, but, but man, we we actually went a lot longer than I thought we would. I know I had told you it was only be like an hour. hour no, I talk man, good, you you we definitely got to get you back. Yeah, we, there's a th- this has been a very insightful, insightful uh, podcast, and we're we're super thankful for you coming here. And we always like to leave uh, our guests with a little opportunity to give any kind of shout outs or yeah. recognitions that they want to give. So floor is kind of yours, you know. Yeah. Well, first of all, thank you guys for having me on the podcast. It's been pretty fun to chop it up and talk about all things, fitness, nutrition, and health. And, uh, as far as shouting people out, obviously my fiance and our, uh, that were found out yesterday that we're expecting a baby girl. So that's going to be new to us. And we're excited about that. And more the reason why 
I need to continue to get my ass up and do the things that yes, I need yeah. to do from a health standpoint and, you know, all the things to make sure that I'm providing uh, for, for my little family now. So yeah. that's, that's good there. Shout out to my mom and dad for, you know, instilling these values in me and allowing me to do the things that I, that I'm doing today. So, yeah. Awesome, man. Awesome. Well, we'll let everybody know where they can find you. I know you're on Instagram, you're on mm -hmm. TikTok. Uh, drop your handles if you. If yeah, you the know. handle is basically uh, Joshua Verdusco. Pretty much type it in. You'll find me anywhere. Actually came on a recent article by uh, Canvas Rebel. They interviewed me there. So just type in Josh and you can find me on Google now. Awesome, man. Awesome. awesome. Well, thanks a lot, Josh. We appreciate you coming in. T, you got any closing? Uh... Man, I don't even want to go into the protein. Uh, next time we're going to get you, we're going to talk about for building muscle protein it's my favorite yeah yeah, we'll, yeah. We'll get, we, we'll get no, you. i don't want to i don't want to normally i guess like we normally have them um probably like shit we've only had a couple back and it's usually an extended one like time period but i'm thinking maybe like next month bring you back in man yeah, yeah. bring you back in if you got time and we'd love mm -hmm. to pick your brain some more because like you said we're we're constantly learning and constantly re revamping and trying to figure out health and nutrition for our longevity yeah. and so um and then so we can pass it on to to our firefighter brothers and sisters out yeah. there but but yeah we'll, well, yeah. well, well i can say this with confidence that y'all are doing a, a phenomenal job at all those things so thank yeah. you brother thank, thank you, you i appreciate it. we try mm -hmm. to we work our ass off and try to keep a standard uh, above average and uh you know having the knowledge that somebody like you provides definitely helps with that so awesome thank you for everything you do brother and to everybody out there at charge the line uh thank you guys for tuning in Till next time, don't forget, charge that line.